Hey folks, welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist. This is the podcast where I talk to a variety of people to help spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. I want to ha- introduce myself so that you know who you're listening to or watching. Uh, my name is Corey Johnston. I'm a laborer in rural Saskatchewan in Canada. I grew up between a family farm and a small community of about 10,000 people, and I eventually moved to a small city of about 230,000 people. Most of the people here are conservative and right-wing with many that would be considered far right. I'm different from that. I'm an anarcho-communist, an atheist, and a skeptic. This means that I try to follow ideas that are better for everyone, uh, but I also try to base those ideas on the best evidence available. As an anarchist, I believe that all people are equal and deserve to be treated as such. Uh, No one is above another, and systems that put people above each other in value are not systems that I can endorse. When you hear anarchists talk about hierarchy, this is what they mean. As a communist, I believe that everyone is entitled to a good life and all things belong to all. There is nuance to this, but above all, it entitles everyone to a safe and good life free from coercion. As an atheist, I am agnostic. It's not just that I don't believe in any god or gods, but I also believe that the claims people make about the god or gods they believe in are inconsistent and often incoherent. My anarchist tendencies mean I try not to judge others for believing things that aren't true or evidence-based, but with my mix of tendencies, I do also try to help people reach the best ideas and come to the best conclusions for everyone, rather than just supporting the status quo or being purely self-interested. I've been podcasting for almost 10 years now. I started with the atheist and skeptic communities in 2013, though I eventually moved on to more progressive communities and spaces as the toxicity and reactionary tendencies in skeptic spaces became more apparent. I do believe that a good skeptic will land on libertarian or anarchist ideals, but nobody who follows the evidence can say that capitalism is good for the world or humanity. I've only been working with video for a couple of years, and I hope that my channel can grow and build a community like some of those I've seen around other channels. However, I don't live online. I have children, a partner, a job that is demanding, and an aging parent who sometimes needs my help. This means my schedule for production is inconsistent. I hope that you will bear with me and that you enjoy my work. I have many ways that you can support this channel, and I always have other projects on the go. So look in the show notes or description box to check those out as well. My Patreon is patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, and I deeply appreciate any support you can send my way. If you have any questions or comments, feel free to contact me through any social media platform or by email at mindofaskepticalleftist at (laughs) gmail.com. All right. Hi, and welcome to The Mind of a Skeptical Leftist, a podcast where I talk to a variety of people to spread critical thinking, progressive politics, and left-wing philosophy. And today I'm joined by Lilith. Yay. Uh, infamous Twitter personality and uh, in re- in real life works with co- cooperatives. So <laughs> That is right. Thank you so much for having me here. As I was telling you earlier, I'm not good at many things, but I'm good at talking. And it seems like you're you're interested in talking, you know, a lot of cool stuff. So thank you for this opportunity. Yeah, for sure. So I guess a little bit, uh, a good place to start is a little bit about yourself, uh, maybe even maybe your political perspective. Oh, very well, it's been a journey. Like I was born in Mexico. So actually I remember because I was such a dork. Like when I was like six years old, there used to be this uh, free newspaper that they would give out downtown. It was like two pages. Whoever wrote it was obviously a Marxist Leninist, except back then I had like no clue what that was. But I remember I was little and I had just learned about the U.S. uh, war against Mexico. And uh, and I was so outraged as a little kid, like, oh, my God, that's unfair. And just for the record, nowadays I'm also, well, Mexico said, settler colonial state too so it's not like they really stole something that long but still you know at least i was like hey like the world's kind of fucked up and then i would see like super rich people and then like i said like whoever wrote that little newspaper had that <laughs> that was one of my first influences right because then that's where he would talk about like uh you know the united states is like this cowboy that just rates others and then he would talk like about fidel castro and i was like i didn't understand a lot of stuff but i was like this seems like something that I don't hear a lot of people say, and I'm trying, even as a little kid, you're trying to understand why the world is the way it is. Yep. And uh, that and my dad, who was a very contradictory person, because on one hand, super horrible human being to me and my family, but on the other, like, I uh, also had little nuggets of, like, uh, radicalism here and there. Okay. Yeah, so um, that was the beginning. But then, just to not go too long, 
Like then I went through the whole arc of interested in Marxism, Leninism and all those. But then I was like, wait, but there was just something bugging me too, you know, about like um like the what people would say about like, you know, those projects, like about the criticisms and you know, like I was like, Yeah, you know, propaganda, this and that, but also it seems like too much for it to be only like right. propaganda. So then I had like the Trotsky's turn, you know, where you're trying to like, <laughs> you're, t- you're still trying to like rescue like Lenin and the state and all that. And then um, actually around the time when I started getting involved myself in a co-op was like a time of reflection. Cause in some ways I was like, um, so busy working and surviving then not too much to be in any organization or movement, but at the same time I was, you know, putting the praxis in real life in a, in a more legit way, you know? And nice. uh, around that time, I was like, yeah, like, I, I'm lying to myself, you know, like, the state is the <laughs> problem to learn into, like, uh, and uh, now I, I guess I could say anarchism without um, adjectives, or at least that's the goal to reach, you know, because I can be pragmatic and nuanced too, but I feel like, you know, that's almost like the most um, legit critique that I see. That's fair. Like, uh, so, like, black flag or anarchism without adjectives, uh currently has like a whole bunch of capitalists kind of attaching itself to it. What do you think of that? <laughs> I mean, I hate capitalism, but you gotta admire its ability to adapt to anything. <laughs> yeah. And it's almost like with punk rock too, right? He was supposed to be rebellious or in hip hop too. It's like, boom, oh, hey, we, we got you. Like we can produce that stuff. So <laughs> I feel like, like almost in any movement, we do have that war for like the control of the narrative and what right. things means. Like that's happening actually a lot too in the, um, like ecological justice. You know, there's like the what people call the big greens. You know, like Bill Gates, Elon Musk, like all, all those like the 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 COP. You know, like the UN conference or like the people responsible for the problem. They say, okay, we're gonna fix it, and this is what's going on. So that's just capitalism, like. You gotta give them props, I guess, for that. Well, not props, something <laughs> horrible, but I feel <laughs> right. like there's not there's not a way to avoid it. So we just gotta do our own cultural work and counter propaganda because anything will get co-opted, no matter how horrible. Like if you get enough traction, it'll get co-opted at some point. Yeah, for sure. So, uh, what do you think of the kind of like anarchist uh, discourse online right now? You know, it's funny because I feel like. Um, Sometimes there's almost like a lack of wanting to understand. And maybe that's part of the problem just uh, with social media. For example, with the anti-work discourse. Oh, yeah. Like, you know, if you interpret good faith, it makes sense. Okay, we're defining work as the forced labor that you got to do, because otherwise you don't get access to this uh, enclosed uh, wealth, whether it's like housing or healthcare or food you know that's why we say like when people say abolish work i understand like in the most uh, honest and uh, well-faith interpretation that's what it means but then you both have like people that at least in theory like that's what they mean but then they come up sometimes with memes or like well i'm gonna steal from your fucking commune and i'm like well like like, it's almost like you're you're pissing a little bit on your own message because i mean (laughs) if you know we're doing things right then that commune or whatever thing like we created ideally would be like oh you need something here you go yeah you don't and, have to steal and, from our commune yeah 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 like <laughs> what uh, or like or like if there isn't enough of something let's say because you know it could be very real maybe water super scarce then maybe like either either that formation is like not legit and like uh, there's some unfair like decision making around the distribution of water or you'll be a total jerk for like them stealing the water you know right like, like, hey like we need to we came up with a plan to make sure we have enough to clean ourselves and water crops so that means you cannot have it for your <laughs> water gun fight you know Right, so, yeah. So you steal it for your water gun fight. No, so you're the jerk. That <laughs> yeah, yeah. Like it's almost like then you're like a mini capitalist. You know, at that point you're not like a radical. You're being like a mini capitalist because that's, that, that's what they did, right? They took shit because they they wanted it and they want more of it. Yeah. On the other, yeah. so so that's why, like like I said, like um. So there's, I see it kind of like that issue, but then on the other hand, I see like all the people were like, no, like the state will tell you what to do. And if you don't do it, you're going to get shot. And I'm like, well, at that point, like, you know, <laughs> even, even in theory, like, I don't think that was ever going to happen, but even in theory, like 
all the Marxist Leninist projects were supposed to abolish like the need to to work to live, right? And you have that quote of Marx that I'm not gonna try to cite, but you know, be a fisherman one day and something else the other day. So <laughs> right? so like the, the discourse a little bit poisoned, but Yeah, yeah. Yeah, I can agree with that. It's it's I I have trouble discussing things on with a lot of other anarchists on Twitter because it seems like no matter what you say, there's like a there's that person who's going to be like, "Yeah, that's not what that's not right" or whatever. <laughs> yeah, yeah, and no, I think there's a lot of like um I'm trying to get a gacha on you yeah, rather than yeah. understanding, you know. Yeah. But on the other hand, I feel like it's better to have I feel like in some ways the mistakes of or the issues that annoy me from our movements is better than you know actually having power and then using it for yeah. fucked up stuff you know like yeah and uh, and on one hand there is i think a certain need also for that kind of like pushing the envelope a little bit like right. that's helpful too i feel like um in small doses you know it's like uh helpful just uh, even water you know when you get too much of it it can be like bad <laughs> <laughs> yeah you can overhydrate. that's right yeah it's yeah. like drinking you have some you know you're having a good time you have too much you like throw up and pass out <laughs> yeah that's right um so one of the things we wanted to talk about today is a, a podcast that you are planning on work doing so uh what is your podcast plan what do you got the name for it uh it's gonna be called everything sucks that's the first one. And then I have another idea for one about more specifically Lucha Libre and politics and music. But I'm starting with like the first one because I like, like my life is busy enough as it is. Let's just take one tiny step at a time. Right. And it's going to be kind of like about what I do online, which pushes a lot of people off, but try to do it in a more serious, well-researched way, which is like a lot of the heroes that we have in the movement in many ways sucked or ended up sucking. Or maybe we're generally good, but then there's some shit that sucks. So Yeah, yeah. Like I got so much hate, for example, when um, discussing what happened like in Bolivia. Putting aside the debate of um, whether it was like a coup or not, like um, and putting in the context that just for the record, you know, like like the mass is like the probably like the best option out there because like all the other kind of like uh, political entities tend to be like super far right. Yeah. So I'm, like I'm real about that. And uh, for example, Evo, like you can easily boom, 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 like show a lot of things where life was improved. But there's a lot of like um, authoritarianism, clientelism that happened in mass, which kind of created friction among the bases. Yeah. So so when the right, you know, was kind of like seizing also the opportunity to destabilize him, it's almost like the narrative is a little bit more complex. There was definitely like a far right and center right who were just like, okay, so turn to like get power. Let's F these people off. But there were like a lot of uh, bases, you know, that for a good amount of reasons were also like, yeah, like, dude, like you need to like, uh, like live too. Oh, okay. So I feel like, for example, telling the story of like that event or even leading up to kind of like the whole arc of Evo from you know, coca leader that unify like so many different movements to this situation where now like the mass is like has its own inner problems, its own inner struggles, and then like tensions between the base and the and the groups. And you know that kind of sucks because the the cool thing would be to say everything's fine. The only bad <laughs> thing that happened is because Elon Musk was trying to steal lithium, and, and boom. But the reality is kind of sucky. But right. we won't learn anything if we don't like acknowledge it. So yeah, like. <sighs> I think that's the great thing about being an anarchist is that you don't have to attach yourself to like the leader, even if, you know, you can say, Hey, they did these good things, but also yeah. they sucked in these ways. Yeah. Yeah. So that's what I'm trying to do. Like about <laughs> different things in history, like for example, like, like a couple, not too long ago, people were like remembering Fidel and you know, right. like a lot of my elders that I love that supported me in my journey to radicalism or kind of like the, the folks that radicalized in the 60s. So they only had all these cool ane anecdotes. Because to his credit, he did live a pretty cool life, but <laughs> not so, but like the, he did also, also put a shitload of people in prison, you yep. know, like, yep. or like um, both like the Soviets and the Cuban state, like still like relied on, uh, on an economic model where they were like, huh, should we help Cuba become so sustainable by restoring like the, 
you know, like the ecosystem that before allowed the people there to live, you know, like uh, comfortably with food without having to import? Or should we just have them build a shed load of, su- of sugar, you know? Right. Which like later down the road, like now the Cuban state without the support of the Soviets realized, holy shit, that wasn't like the wisest choice. So, yeah, you know, it's like trying to be, it's a little bit of being a party pooper, but... <laughs> I did study. Like, the funny thing, I study history, and like I'm not applying what I learned at all. So I feel like this would be a good way to exercise, like the muscle cast. Yeah, no, that yeah. sounds like a great idea. That sounds like mm-hmm. a very, a really interesting podcast. Yeah, because online is just kind of like a little more fun. More fun. I, I don't have like the time to be like in those debates because I also, at the end of the day, like they don't convince anybody. Yeah, but I do want to do have one place where I do something serious, and this will be it. That's cool. So you also uh, want to talk about lucha libre and uh, and politics. So I'm curious about how the the two mix there. Oh boy, there's like so many angles <laughs> in which you see a similarity. Maybe like the most obvious one, especially for example, to someone that is familiar with the two party system of the United States. Is that, you know, pro wrestling, and I hope I'm not breaking anybody's heart here. You know, it's like scripted fighting. I right. love it. And yeah. The, yes, yes, you know, the danger is, is real. And and sometimes um, when they hate each other, they do what call what it's called being stiff. When you do like, like sneak oh. up on someone or, or you don't allow them to do their move. So they, they look shitty. And that, that's another, <laughs> that's another, another thing. But for example, like on a, like a comparison is like um, when everything works right, you know, you have this fictional combat and um, when it's done right, then you kind of like buy into it. Like it feels like whether you believe it's real or you're a little kid or whatever you like, you kind of submerge yourself in the fantasy. Right. Yep. And then you cheer maybe for like the good guy, because there's also like good guy and the bad guy, which in recent terms is like the face and the heel. Right. And, you know, you buy into it. And the funny thing is that the two wrestlers in reality are, even though they're pretending to fight, in reality they're collaborating with each other to fool you into thinking it's like a real combat. Yeah. And in a lot of ways, then you can make that comparison to like the, the you know, <laughs> politics of like liberal, liberal democracies, right? Where they do have like different parties and, you know, yep. they're at each other's throats, but at the end of the day, they're part of like that same show of capitalism where it's like, this is all there is, you know? Yeah, like, like the, there's no alternative. This is all there is. So just pick your side and like uh, cheer for them. Yeah, absolutely. That that almost like could be overlaid over top of uh, U.S. politics just really easily. It, like, yeah, yeah. It's just yeah, like, either. of course, they're both collaborating. <laughs> yeah, you have like the Democrats are the face and the Republicans are the heels, but. Well, really depending on course. which side you're on, yeah, right? Yeah, 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 of course. <laughs> uh, I, yeah, I, I'm, assuming that, <laughs> I'm assuming that you're trying to at least not be a shitty person within the narrow <laughs> scope of politics, you know? Yeah, 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 fair. But it's true, yeah, yeah, for the for like the other people, the other their their guys are like the good guy. Yeah, Trump is the the face, you know, going against all the dirty heels, right? Yep, yep. We have that in Canada too, where it's like uh Trudeau is the face and uh I think Pierre Polyevra right now is the heel, and, mm-hmm. and but we have uh, we have a third party, Jagmeet Singh, who's kind of one of those. He's not right in the narrative. He's like mm-hmm. an alternative person. <laughs> so no, and then like and then you can look at the politics within pro wrestling, almost like the replication of capitalism. You know, like a few promoters, okay, you know, paying crap wages to their. Um, Right. To the wrestlers, even though they're literally putting their body on the line, because um, I mean that is scripted. Like, like even in the most basic of moves, you're like basically falling flat on your back. You know, obviously you try to do their good, but like, what people don't realize that shit hurts. Like the the mat where they do, there's technically protection, but it still like hurts. You know, right? It's kind of like uh, getting hit with a boxing glove uh, still hurts, even though it's like padded. Yep. So, um, so there's that, or like uh, Vince McMahon, you know, like one yep. day they want to do like a podcast uh, episode about him. He's like the Donald Trump of um, pro wrestling. For sure. Like, there was all these regional promotions and then he kind of like destroy them, create this one product. So like, at least to most of the world, pro wrestling is WWE, like his company, you know, like he can even yeah. though there's many other ones out there and those of us who are nerds kind of like know them, but for the broader public, like he made it. So like pro wrestling equals like WWE. 
Yep. Yep. And then you see stuff like, uh, you know, they have like a whole army of writers and managers and um, what used to be an um, uneven uh, relationship, but with still some leverage from the wrestler saying, hey, I'm interested in doing this and I work well with this guy. So let's like maybe pretend that we have this thing going on. It's not top down. Like now you're going to say this exact same script, you know, hit these bullet points. Um, and also we're going to perform in Saudi Arabia because we got a shitload of money from them. So. Right. So it's, um, and then there's the pecking order in pro wrestling where like, uh, you know, like there's gotta be this tough guy that rules in the locker room and, you know, they, you, you have to allow them to maybe beat you up a little bit for real for you turn your stripes and <laughs> God forbid you're a woman or a queer person, you know, right? because you're making pro wrestling look ridiculous, even though like, you know, <laughs> ridiculous is part of like That's pro part wrestling, of the deal, you know? yeah. Yeah, yeah. or like, I'm not going to respect your pronouns, but please do call me Undertaker, you know, like, right, right. Yeah. Come on. <laughs> I think uh, pronouns are the least of the ridiculous things in wrestling. Yeah, yeah. So, so that, like I said, <laughs> there's like a lot, a lot to to pull from. That's awesome. I guess, I guess one last bit that is in more particular to Mexica, Mexico, like for example, and related to like, like the mask is you know they're like um, for a lot of uh, pro wrestlers, like the mask is part of like their their business, you know. So people recognize them, what you sell, you know, complements your income. Right. So um, this would be an interesting episode too, like in the kind of boom of like the nineties when like more when there was more wrestling on TV and it was becoming popular. A lot of folks came from small towns. And, uh, you know, they went to the city to try to make it. And they weren't having a lot of things like around copyrights. So oh. then a lot of the promoters, they would like uh, see that a character would be popular. They would copyright it behind their back. Oh. And if there was a problem with the pro wrestler, they'd be like, okay, you're fired. I'm just going to give the mask to another person. And what are you going right. to do about it? I already registered. Yeah. Underhanded capitalists. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So like I said, like, like uh, there's a lot, a lot of parallels, you know. For sure. Yeah. Yeah, that's I I watched wrestling when I was young, but I was never like I I kind of fell off of it in the I don't know my mid twenties, which I guess is old enough. But <laughs> yeah, <laughs> but yeah, like uh, I guess when The Rock and and Triple H were <laughs> big and and WCW wasn't a thing anymore, yeah. it was all WWE. So. Uh, "Quote unquote capitalism breeds innovation, right? Right, uh, yeah. <laughs> but it eats everything up. <laughs> yeah, it just one company absorbs every yeah, other freaking yeah. company. Yeah, no good. So, what about uh, co-op co-ops? You work in co-ops in your real life. Yeah, it was an interesting journey because I started in a silkscreen print shop. Okay." Yeah, and then the, our boss, he was, you know, I guess people, I don't know what people would call him, a Radley or a reformist, or I don't know how <laughs> he would identify himself, but, um, you know, like all persons, he was, you know, full of contradictions, not like I'm not, but at some point he wanted to get rid of the business and was saying, oh, maybe we can turn into a co-op, that way, like, I leave it to you all. Right. Okay. And that was a very interesting experience because on one hand, it's, you know, like having full freedom over like your workplace was like sweet, but, um, but also we had like no, no resources or technical idea of how to do many things. Ah. So on one hand, you know, it was like super pleasant experience. Like we would be like cooking together, like helping each other out, like our schedules would always be subservient to our needs. So like one friend, like, oh, I need to like go to school and do this. I don't worry. Like who can step in, you know, like we would right. be helping each other out all the time. But uh, then you see kind of like what our status try to use as an argument, which has a degree of le legitimacy, but I feel like their conclusions are like wrong. And so then you face like then the real conditions of the world, right? Like, okay, we enjoy this. But we still have to meet or, or need, you know, like food, housing, yep. all that. So that means we still have to make uh, money somehow. Yep. And then uh, that's where you navigate. Oh, okay, do you get like the shittiest shirts from like sweatshops, you know, because like then yeah. like you'll have like a bigger surplus or you get the fancy ones that people maybe not can't or won't want to buy. Like uh, what do you do with like the like the waste that you have, like do we want to like poison mother earth too? Um, right. Or like our, our own productivity want to be like, 
you know, taking hits like from bombs in the back all the time or like finishing the the order on time, you know? <laughs> right. So like we don't make any mistakes and then have to like uh, redo it. Yeah. Um, it, it went terrible <laughs> almost uh it reminds me of like the criticisms of like the also the experiments like in spain you know in some ways very inspiring but on another real level also not quite didn't like, always uh, go the way yeah. one plans <laughs> yeah but but it, but still you know i was thinking okay in the more traditional like established left or say the uh, almost like the one of the first step of uh, socialism is the nationaliz nationalization of things. Right. Right. So, and then the, on the other hand, there's criticism. So, you know, co ops are, are like uh, trying to do an island of socialism in a sea of capitalism. And there's a certain degree of truth on that. But even throughout that experience, and as I have interacted with other uh, co ops, I still feel like they're a better bridge between surviving now and learning how to um, collaborate. Right. And uh, from that, you know, creating that new world versus the, the top-down national nationalized company. I feel like even in or, or uh, even in my experience, like uh, I was like, this seems a lot more closer to socialism than I'm thinking. All like people, like you know, Mexico, for example, has a nationalized um, state company for oil, Pemex. Right. And I'm like, I would take a shot that I have a lot more say here and it's a lot more horizontal. And for example, like on May Day, we could like shut down the shop and go support or print right. out shirts for a group. Like this feels a lot more closer to what we're trying to build than those big top-down nationalized enterprises. So yeah, for sure. I'm not saying they're the magic bullet, but I do think like uh, they're worth, worth exploring because you know we can fight and burn down all we want, but we also have to think, okay, then what are we building ourselves? Yeah, I'm a big fan of the the co-op uh, co uh, work environment. I think, like, it sounds like maybe if you had been given better tools, yeah. <laughs> your your business could have had a better chance of success. <laughs> but, yeah, no, that's the thing. Like, ironically, I'm like, oh boy, if I could have what I do for others, what I do for other projects now, like, we would have been like uh, successful, right? Eh, but uh, I guess. Sometimes failure teaches us lessons too, right? Mm -hmm. But yeah, it's I'm I, like Richard Wolf has a, he promotes co-ops a lot, and I'm a big fan of the idea. Even though I don't think it's the solution, I think it's a tool in our toolbox yeah. that we can use. Yeah, yeah, me too. Like for example, maybe like there's this cool one in Bellingham, Washington. So it's kind of close. It's actually close to to Canada called uh, Tierra Libertad, and it's like, led by farm, wor farm workers, you know, one of the most exploited uh, sectors in the yeah. US economy. And, you know, like right now, like uh, they're struggling and all, but, you know, like they have plans to build housing on their land. So it's similar to the Hido system in Mexico, which is like communal land and housing. Okay. They're, a lot of what they produce is what the workers themselves consume. So they're like thinking of a cyclical, you know, circular economy. And right. they're trying to get other folks from the community on board. So like, I feel like I wanted to shout out like a legit example. So people don't think it's all in yeah, the abstract. Yeah, fair. No, that's fair. <clears throat> well, we're almost at 30 minutes. But before I go into counter propaganda, I want to ask about this particular mask that you're wearing. Uh, this was like the sensation of like 2005, 2006 called Mystico. Okay. And it's like Mystic. Uh, in Mexico, there's two um, big Lucha Libre promotions, AAA. That's the one that's a little bit more like WWE, but I, I like them. They're fun. And there's the CML, CMLL, which is like the oldest running uh, pro wrestling promotion that still operates. Okay. You know, but also a shitload of nepotism uh, and corruption. <laughs> of course. <laughs> And most likely, if you know anything about Lucha Libre, even if you don't know the name, you have seen the mass of El Santo, the saint. Most likely, a mass that you have seen is either his or based from him. So forever, like, all the promoters, they wanted to create the next santo because he was, like, super big, you know? Like, they say, like, uh, bigger than what Hulk Hogan was, like, in the United States. Like, if right. you see, like, his funeral, like, flooded, like, wow. like with people. So... This was like almost like the 2005 like uh, pre-successful attempt of a new Santo, because he was like, well, he still is, because he's now back in the company, like high flyer, like those all these cool 
acrobatics and um he was like uh, re really cool really fun really fun to watch and nice. you know like he drew so many people in the arena so that's one of his ones he's still one of my favorite pro wrestlers so that's check awesome. him out mystical <laughs> cool all right so on to counter propaganda uh we've got some false solutions to the climate catastrophe well, what do you think what are some uh, solutions that people are putting forward that are false? Well, it's like the, I mean, there's room to debate here, but the problem is that a lot of the solutions are based, you know, in the capitalist idea of uh, forever expanding, forever developing, and, you know, this technocracy, like you have this idea of like creating stuff to, to shield like the, the sun, it's like to shield the earth from the sun, carbon sequestration, like our people are thinking, oh, what app can we do to like help uh, people people out? Or even like the idea, okay, we just got to have like electronic cars, everyone. Right. Yeah, so the, the <laughs> conversation, like right now, I think things are bad enough that while there's still, you know, this group that just straight up denies there's climate change, there's like a bigger section of people that are like, okay, yes, there is, but all their solutions are basically like green capitalism. Yeah. that don't address like the the root cause like um you know instead of electric cars almost keeping even fossil fuel cars but reorganizing cities so it's easier to move either walking or biking or through public transportation that's already like a a lot better like yeah. solution yeah. or like uh you know there's this term called uh bioregionalism and that's okay. the idea, rather than saying, okay, what's the most ecological way to still have airplanes flying all around the world or big ships carrying everything? How can we base the economies more around the ecosystem? Right. So that, like, um, you know, back in the day, like an apple brought from far away was for real a so luxury because, you know, it's always reflected more accurately the, all the effort that it would take you to eat like an apple off season. Like now, you know, through like capitalism has made this kind of magic where you can have everything all the time, but like that's unsustainable, you know, yeah, over the long right. time. We can make priorities. Maybe there's some stuff like medicine, for example, that I would hope there's a way to get it quickly to or like everyone. like people want their coffee forever. Like they yeah, always yeah. <laughs> yeah, but there's other stuff like, come on, like um, we gotta like rethink the economy. And there's like a lot of wisdom, both from like, the indigenous people that have been preserving their territories against extractivism you know they're like the ones that have preserved like their ecosystem the best you know so right there's the that should be like a like the folks that deserve more of a voice than like you know bill gates or all those people like all those hot shots from like even the oil industry yep yeah you know they want to build this fancy machine when in reality the solutions are kind of like there but because they they also undermine capitalism, they um, get sidelined. Yeah, the thing uh, like, there's a couple lines that I always like to hear that like when people say, "Well, we can't buy our way out of climate change," or like, <clears throat> like, because that's obviously true, right? <laughs> mm -hmm. <laughs> just buying more products doesn't solve the problem. Mm -hmm. yep. <laughs> just because they say green on them. Yeah, yeah. Silly. Yeah. It reminds me, like, there was this yoga mats that were supposed to be eco-friendly that were made of, like, some um, kind of cloth. Okay. And it's like, okay, like, so you're producing more of those things, which will wear down over time, because technically green, when even the plastic one or, like, the rubber one, like, it might be kind of bad how it came from, but at least it will last, like, forever, so. Right. Or, yeah. like, um, <laughs> and, and I guess more specific to the big bad solutions, like, there was like in, I think it was 2017, 18, like a big conference in California with Jerry Brown and all like the hot shots of like, like um, climate change, oh, like yeah. all the big greens they call them. And, you know, while like all like the impacted communities were out there like protesting or, you know, kind of doing cultural work out on the streets to counter that message inside there. They were proposing things. What if we bring like water all the way from Florida into like California? <laughs> And yeah. like, have you not learned, you know, like the, the resources that it would take to do that, whatever impacts we may not foresee versus, huh, there's a shit lot of golf courses that take up, up a lot of water, a lot yep. of crops that to be honest are water intensive. And, you know, you don't have to be vegan to be like, also like maybe, 
you know, cattle consumption at an industrial level, like even if you have no moral qualm about eating a cow, like takes up a shitload of water. So, yeah, you know, those would be like more solutions that get to the problem. But, you know, like I said, those people have like their magic technological stuff just so they don't have to disrupt anything. Right. Yeah. They don't want, they don't want to lose their golf courses. So instead yeah. they will fly water from Florida. <laughs> Yeah, yeah, and ask you to take five minutes showers, you know? <laughs> yeah, that's right. Absurd. Yeah, but then the thing is, you know, the main discourse is like either you go with those people or you go with the ones that say it's not happening at all. Right, yeah, yeah. So that... see, like, pro wrestling right there, too. Like, you got... <laughs> right, you got your heel in your face. <laughs> yeah. Yeah, it's it's really unfortunate, like, especially, like you said, the electric car thing. Like there's actual organizations in Saskatchewan where I live now that are like pushing the electric car narrative as the solution to climate change. And I'm, I'm not anti electric car, but we do have to recognize that like we need walkable cities. We need public transportation. You can't solve it by just everybody buying a new $60,000 yeah, yeah. uh, electric car. Yeah, exactly. Like me too. I don't think so. bad idea. Like if, I were to need a car right now and I, I would maybe try to get an electric one. But like you said, like if anything, the real solution is like making it so not so many people need cars, leave that yeah. for maybe those who do need it. But we need like <laughs> this idea that everyone will have a car, let alone multiple, you know, like the American idea, like that's yeah. impossible. <laughs> or I like, I like, uh, I mean, we're, we're far from it, but I like the idea that we would have fewer cars, but they would be more like a, uh, communally owned kind of thing where like, okay, I can go and I can get the car that I need. And as long as I return it in good shape, then it's, you know, it can be used by the next person. Yeah. That's kind of like the talking about cooptation with uh, Uber co-opted. It's not right. really, it's not really a right share, you know, it's just like a way to do a taxi service without paying benefits, but, <laughs> the, the, yeah. but, but you can see how it could like, uh, like work out, you know, or yeah. I could even see a thing where like somebody whose job is just really to be picking up people that need a, a yeah. ride, you know? Yeah. And then you only need like one electric vehicle that's yeah. going around yeah. doing the job. Yeah. Right? Yeah. 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 Uh, you know, like there's all the false solutions, you know, like trying to, like you said, buy your way out of climate catastrophe. Yeah. yeah. The, uh, it's, there's lots of good ideas where a person can come up with it without having to buy into the existing system that I find it really odd that every solution that's proposed is like, oh yeah, plus this will make huge profits for so-and-so. Yeah, yeah, <laughs> like, exactly. <laughs> what the fuck? That's, that's messed up. You know, it's one way or another. So it's about like making that money. Yeah, that's right. Well, let's go on to uh, foes and comrades. <laughs> so for foes, you have a bunch of online tankies. <laughs> oh, yes. Like the latest one. I think his username might be a Windward Maroon, which is a shame because the Maroon villages were so badass. And, you know, I think something to learn from in terms of autonomous, rebellious uh, communities. Right. But like uh, this dude is saying like the, the biggest thing that you can do to stop climate catastrophe, his words, and, and like all his followers will find me over it, is supporting the Belt Road Initiative. Okay. And I'm like, you know, you could even argue from if you have like a more sympathetic thing. Okay, maybe for certain countries, the Belt Road might be a preferable way to do like a development, or at least it gives them like leverage between the United States and China to find like the, the best deal. So, okay, that could be one conversation. Sure. But to say that is going to be like the best solution to climate catastrophe, when in reality, like the purpose of it, just like any other project that a power does to like a support development of quote unquote underdeveloped countries is just to facilitate them. Um, yeah. capitalism and the extraction of like resources like you know there was when um in the 60s when kennedy did the alliance for progress too right because people are like oh like china's like you know giving like money explaining like you know the united states did that at some point too for the same reason to build their hegemony soft power and uh, maybe some of that money was used for good some of it went in the pockets of like uh 
like the leader, some the the same thing might happen with the VRI, but like come on, like this, like you really are gonna be fighting so hard over saying that's the solution to right to yeah. climate catastrophe. Yeah, yeah so um, that's the story of one of my current biggest foes right now. Like at some point, I bump heads into Esha. I don't know if you ever or S. I forget. Like it's the kind of uh, person that gets featured into those um independent journalist outlets that are just offshoots of RT news. Oh yeah. Yeah, like the gray yeah. zone or <laughs> Yeah, yeah, like uh, like there's this other like um like journalist, quote unquote journalist from Bolivia too, who's just like peddling like, you know, pro like government lines all the time. All Oli Vargas, I think that's his name. Like, oh my god. <laughs> like <laughs> and I'm not a violent person, dude, but one day we bump heads, like I don't know what might happen. <laughs> yeah it's there is like i don't know if it's like a worship of authority or or what it or believing that they just their team is right but there is still a lot of like leftists who who seem to have like a real like i don't know real totalitarian streak in their rhetoric mm-hmm. like they really just love to be like, oh yeah, well, if you don't side with us, then we're gonna liquidate you. Like, yeah, what the fuck is that? <laughs> no, like, uh, you know, I used to crap a lot on the horseshit theory, but I feel like if anything, it just shows like the left right, uh, like framework is not very helpful sometimes, right? Cause, like, yeah, there's other dimensions to like politics, and yes, there's these people that just kind of want to worship power one way or right, another, eh? yeah, like, what, like like they've got the four quadrants or whatever and up in the bo- upper left you've got extreme authoritarianism yeah. <laughs> it's like yeah I, I i didn't really believe in it before but actually there's some people who are definitely fit that role yeah yeah for sure but you know on the other hand i've encountered a lot of like uh cool people too on on twitter yeah like i wish i would have memorized maybe a list of a couple of people <laughs> to boost them up but i can think of them right now but if you follow me you'll you'll encounter them very cool yeah yeah there's i, I don't want to paint the entire left as like a, a bad because obviously i'm on the left so yeah it's just i get really frustrated with those particular people because we share some of the same politics mm-hmm. and then they say things like if you don't do what we say, then we'll liquidate you. <laughs> yeah, that's the thing. And you know, that's the, that's the thing that's tough, for example, because people are like, oh, like, you don't do anything in real life. You're just criticizing. And in reality, just, so you'll know haters. I do do stuff in real life a lot. <laughs> yeah. uh, and that is almost like the the reason why I want like the podcast or, you know, I do this stuff online because in the real life, it's like tough maybe to share like on someone that, you know, they have the right, the best intentions, that they're fighting the good fight, but they just really think, like, this figure, like, is saying the truth and that's the solution. And, you know, like, I don't want to, like, completely crap on someone, you know, because uh, I was there at some point, and yeah. it's harder when you're collaborating, like, with them. But also, like, the truth is the truth, and, you know, it's not a problem maybe when we're both fighting the same fight, but the second power starts getting involved, you know, then that's where things start. Uh, there's consequences to like the ideas like people hold. Yeah. That's, that's like uh kind of the whole anarchist Leninist split, right. Is like the, yeah. like, yeah, we, we agree on a lot of stuff, but when it comes to like, you want to rule over me at the end, uh, I'm just not down for that. Like <laughs> kind of believe and, people should be free. But And you know, the ironic thing is that when I had a, originally gotten into Twitter like uh, a long time ago it was to follow Hugo Chavez because I found him hilarious and I still kind of saw him through rosy eyes and to follow ah. I forget which World Cup but uh, one of the World Cups <laughs> and now here I am kind of like uh, raging with tankies and <laughs> <laughs> yeah. uh, that's all right uh, they kind of helped me boost my stuff so yeah there you go Arguing with people who will quote tweet you can also gain you followers. <laughs> yeah, yeah, like that very cynic, cynical thing of there's no such thing as bad publicity. Right, yeah, that's right. Um, so I guess before we uh, – is there anything that we haven't touched on that you want to talk about? Well, now just to recap, like um, like I don't know if like on the vi- – oh, yes, I think on the video the name shows, right? Yeah, so if anybody's interested, you know, that's the same, my uh, Twitter handle. 
uh, one of my projects within this month is to like do the intro and like try to do like the first podcast episode. So if you're interested in that, it'll still take a while, but you know, it'll be cool for you to, um, uh, to follow and support and, you know, awesome. don't fall for false solutions and support extractivism <laughs> and, you know, just, just be nice too. Like there's something about being super radical, but you forget, you know, just to treat others nicely. So yes, don't be a right. dick. Yeah, that's right. Cool. Well, thank you so much for your time. I really appreciate it. Thank you. Uh, thank you so much for the opportunity. And hopefully you get all the fancy guests that you're trying to get. <laughs> yep, for sure. All righty. Take it easy. Have a good one. See you. That's all, folks. Thanks for watching or listening. Remember to share this show with your friends or on the social media site that you use the most. Thank you to everyone who supports this show on Patreon. It's really appreciated and it helps me spend more time on this and my other projects. If you want to contribute, you can do that at patreon.com slash skeptical leftist, or you can buy me a coffee at buymeacoffee.com slash skeptical lefty. If you can't contribute financially, then a five-star rating or a and a review on the podcast app of your choice or on one of the podcast review sites like Podchaser or ratemypodcast.com would be great. If you want to find more from me, make sure to check out the show notes or check out my link tree. That's linktr.ee slash skeptical court. You can find all my social media stuff there, as well as links to my other show from many people's strength, which is a podcast about Saskatchewan politics and a project I'm involved in with my friend Damien Marie at hope. That's called atheist, humanist, leftist revolutionaries. My Twitter is at skeptical lefty and my Facebook page is the mind of a skeptical leftist. You can email me at mind of a skeptical leftist at gmail.com. And if you want to be a guest on the show or know someone I should reach out to, then feel free to let me know. You can book interviews in my available time slots on my Calendly, which is also found in my link tree. Thanks so much for listening, and let's try to make sure we're applying critical thinking and reasoned skepticism when we're attacking the system. If we get caught up in bad thinking, we can derail ourselves. <laughs>